todas e a todos. Obrigado por terem vindo. Esta é a última conferência do ciclo de conferências do Doutoramento de Território, Risco e Políticas Públicas e também a terceira iniciativa conjunta com o University College of London, que já fazemos há três anos. Agora vamos ficar com a conferência do professor David Alexander. I'll present you in Portuguese and then talk to you in English, of course. O professor David Alexander é professor na University College of London, professor de Risk and Disaster Reduction. Uh, foi uh, diretor durante muitos anos, 2003 a 2007, do Advanced School of Civil Protection do Governo Regional da Lombardia, no, na Itália. Foi e é uh, professor visitante das Universidades de Bournemouth North, uh, and Nor uh, Northumbria, Coimbra, Coimbra claro, e Lund, e foi também Research Fellow uh, at Global Risk Forum in Davos. Também é um dos fundadores e o editor-chefe, o redator principal, da uh, International Journal of Disaster Risk Reduction e também foi co-editor ou co-diretor da revista, do, do journal uh, Disasters. Uh, é e o vice-presidente e, e, e coordenador do Trustees of the Institute of Civil Protection Emergency Management da Grã-Bretanha, a instituição mais antiga nesta área e para aqueles em junho, estou já uh, a convidar, todos os anos o University College faz o seu encontro anual em junho, que eu tenho a honra de participar e veremos que há uma componente muito importante de ligação à proteção civil da Grã-Bretanha, aqueles que tiverem a oportunidade uh, de ir. Em 2013 ganhou um prémio importante, uh, o prémio de International Society for Integrated Disaster Risk Management. So, David, it is a pleasure to have you here again as a visiting professor of the University of Coimbra and a friend and a colleague that has helped me personally and the Risk Observatory and SESH for so many years as an expert and as a, a colleague in this field of disaster risk reduction in a country that has suffered a lot. The fires, the big fires, forest fires 2017 and 119 people dead, the big storm now in October 2018, now the mild drought in January, uh, we have been Uh, with this weather for the last uh, amount, but you talk about uh, 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 <coughs> the things you've been uh, researching. It's a pleasure, it's an honor to have you here, and the, the title, as you have there, The Contest of Disaster Search for Root Causes. I told them also, in Portuguese, that they are invited to come to London for an annual meeting, where they will see the interaction between the University College Institute for Disaster Research, uh, Reduction, sorry, and the civil protection institutions and authorities. It's a must uh, meeting to be and to learn a lot. Thank you, David. The floor is yours. Thank you. Obrigado. Bom dia. E Pedro desculpa por não poder falar em português. I hope my English is going to be good enough <laughs> for uh, comprehensible at least. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about something to which I don't know the answer. Um, I've thought long and hard about it, I will continue to do so, but frankly I don't know the answer. Nevertheless, I think that this is extremely important. We have to understand disasters properly to do something about them, and I wonder if we do. I was at this meeting a couple of years ago. It was in the United Nations headquarters a conference centre in Geneva, And we were all talking, thousands of us, about how to apply science and its benefits to reducing disaster risk. Now, during that conference, the following report came out. Oxfam, 62 people own half of the world's disposable wealth. And incidentally, the next biennial report says that 43 people now own half of the world's disposable wealth. I don't know what happened to the other 19. But this is a fact of extreme importance. The world's wealth is at least half commandeered by a, enough people to get into a single bus. And yet nobody at the UN conference said a word about it except me. I spoke about it, but I received really no feedback on what I said. Somehow I think this is a fundamental, essential fact because it conditions what we can do with the world's resources regarding things like poverty reduction and disaster risk reduction. 
The question is, what can we do? And how can we connect up these different facts? And that's what I'd like to try to address today, as far as I can, which you will see is unfortunately not very far. But if we can set off a train of thought, then perhaps we can all think about this. We need to consider our world as it actually is, with all its brutalities and all its problems, rather than hiding our head in the sand collectively about the realities of the world that we live in. Now, science encourages us to think of the world as something that we can analyze according to one single reality. There is truth out there, and with science we can uncover it. Well, that is partially the case, but not entirely. And one thing that I have learned in 39 years of studying disasters is that there are many different realities, and one way or the other, they're all valid. Therefore, we need to think in a very pluralistic kind of way. Science has its place, and it is very important. <coughs> One thing we could ask of science, the question we must ask indeed is, science for whom? What science and for whom? So, we're dealing, of course, with human misery in its various kinds, so we might add climate change to that process. I'm going to talk about disasters, but my message to you is, I don't think we can talk about disasters unless we really start to look at some of the other issues and some of the causes of human misery that are not directly connected to the issue of disasters. They nevertheless have a significant relevance. So we started with a model which perhaps it began about a hundred years ago when disaster studies began to get into gear. Disaster studies are roughly 100 to 101 years old. They, they began around about December to uh, 1917. And let's call that the orthodox model. And it has the advantage of being nice and linear. A physical event occurs, whether it's human induced or whether it's a natural extreme, doesn't matter. But it acts upon human vulnerability. And that gives us our consequences in terms of disaster destruction, damage, casualties, whatever. In the late 1970s, culminating in 1983, a group of researchers proposed an alternative in which they suggested, and it became known as the Radical Critique, led by Kenneth Hewitt of Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada, that in fact human vulnerability is the real cause of disaster, not the physical event, which is little more than a trigger, although it does have a feedback mechanism to the human conditions that lead to disaster. Now, has that lesson been learned? Has that been absorbed into the way we study disasters? To an extent it has, but actually if you still look at the way we do things, you'll find that vulnerability has a much smaller following than hazard does, despite the so-called radical critique. But nevertheless, here we are in the 21st century using 20th century theory. It's time we stopped doing that and started building something that is fit for the present century and the monumental changes that are going on within it. So in fact, what we currently need in order to understand the human consequences of disaster is somehow to draw together culture, the physical impact, history, which doesn't condition what will happen next, but it is very useful as a guide to some of the possibilities. And I want to talk today particularly about context of all of this. Right. There are constraints on that process. What is culture? How do we define it? Very, very difficult. Quantitatively, it's almost impossible. But nevertheless, we know it's there. We know there is a Portuguese culture. We know there is a culture of Coimbra. We know there are cultures in different places and with different groups of people, different age groups, different ethnic groups, and so on and so forth. And they're all valid and valuable. Economics, which acts as a constraint upon <laughs> what we can afford to do. History, which acts as a constraint upon culture and access to knowledge, very important. Human rights are absolutely vital to disaster risk reduction. And one reason why is that deprivation of human rights 
stops people's access to knowledge. So, root causes are vitally important, but I don't think that we have devoted enough attention to analysing exactly what the root causes of disaster are. The consequence of that is that disaster will not go away. We talk about disaster risk reduction, but what is actually happening in many places is the opposite. Disaster risk creation or increase rather than reduction. And vulnerability has a depressing tendency to replicate itself and to grow rather than to reduce itself. And small wonder then that disasters occur around the world at the rate of about two a day. They're anything other than exceptional events. So I propose the egg model. There it is. Disaster is the yolk, right? We have the causes, we even have the root causes, the vulnerabilities, but there is one very simple axiom here, and that is, I don't believe that we can understand disaster without understanding its context, the white of the egg. If you'd like to see that in a simpler form, there it is. Marginalisation and impoverishment really are something <coughs> that conditions disaster. And the axiom is this, you cannot achieve disaster risk reduction unless you can make people safe against other things. For example, in the United Kingdom, we have one and a half million people who are destitute. How can you create disaster risk reduction for, for people who, in normal life, are officially classified as destitute, meaning that they cannot afford to buy the basics of a normal, civilised, safe, comfortable, reasonable life? And things are getting worse in that respect, and, and with Brexit and so on, they like to get dramatically worse. But more about that shortly. So that also ushers in the question of what exactly is resilience? Well, we could have a simple definition of it. And resilience has a 2,000-year history, many different contexts and many different developments, and therefore definitions. But if we go back to the mid-19th century, we could define resilience in the way that specialists in mechanics engineers, physicists did it. They would take a material, clay, wood, steel, subject it to a stress, and it would bend until it broke. Now, to be resilient, the material had to have strength to resist the force and ductility to absorb it by bending. And a society, by analogy, needs to have an optimum combination of resistance, ability to resist the stress of the disaster, and adaptation, which is the ductility, the bending, to absorb the force applied to society. So resistance and adaptability, the two fundamental um, qualities needed in order to create resilience. Very simple. The trouble with resilience is often that too much is read into a simple concept and it is endowed with magical properties that in reality it just hasn't got. And then we get to situations where resilience becomes politicised. It is not easy to interpret this uh, poster that appeared on a lamp post in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. But it was clear that the relationship between the real victims, the living survivors of Hurricane Katrina and the authorities was not a happy one in which resilience was feared to be by the victims a tool in order to oppress them in some manner rather than something that might set them free or liberate them from the trials and the problems of post-disaster recovery. Was it indeed uh, an agent of post-disaster neoliberal urbanism, or was it something that enabled and helped people? A good question. Now, in the world more generally, and this is a diagram I produced in a book in 2000, therefore it's practically 20 years old, uh, but nevertheless, I think it's still valid. If we think about recovery from disaster in somewhere like New Orleans, which had tremendous differences between rich and poor, there were, for example, 20,000 people who didn't have cars. How could they evacuate 
if nothing was organized for them. It was eventually organized, but very late in the day, and it led to things like forced evacuation, which is something of dubious value. But anyway, capital is winning over labor. Uh, we have that duality between the two, but in the modern neoliberal world, capital is very much stronger than labor, especially with the kind of technological development that puts us back to some of the situations of the Industrial Revolution, where labor feared that it would lose its strength, its jobs and so on, to automation. Uh, the same is, is practically happening in, in the present day. And then there is austerity, debt versus democracy, if you like. Who actually commissions austerity? Well, the rich. Who actually pays for austerity? Well, the poor. What we find in Britain, for example, is that the last budget, in other words, the last government effort to uh, configure the way that public money is spent, produced a massive tax relief for the rich, the very rich, and further austerity for the very poor. And the austerity falls extremely unfairly upon those on the lowest income or no income. And that is what we have found over the last eight years in the United Kingdom. And we'll see some of the effects of that upon disaster in just a moment. So capital winning against labor. Labor is fighting back. For example, we have the Gilets jaunes in, uh, in France. And that is, what is it? Well, it's an expression in a country that is used to revolution of extreme dissatisfaction with government policies that under the guise of creating employment and wealth and so on, uh, which never trickles down to the lowest levels, impoverish people. And that is what we are finding. That is part of the context of disaster. How can you create, therefore, resilience against disaster when you are destroying the general resilience that forms the context of people's interaction with disaster? Capital could be a resource for disaster mitigation, recovery if disaster has already happened, but will it be? It isn't necessarily harmed by disaster, but that is very much because it is at some distance. Okay, we often hear that disasters cost a great deal of money, but they are also tremendous economic stimulants, actually. The question, however, is for whom are they economic stimulants? Generally not for the victims who have lost their homes or whatever, their assets or their family members and so on. But nevertheless, that doesn't mean that the harm is done to capital as a phenomenon. So does capital safeguard people or does it safeguard itself? It always strikes me as ironic that much these days in the poorer countries of the world depends on remittances, places like Haiti and the Philippines and so on, remittances really do hold these places up, but it costs quite a lot of money to send money. In fact, the most expensive thing you could buy in the world is money. And yet at the same time, if you are a capitalist, you can transfer money in a microsecond, quite literally a microsecond, and make a profit out of that at no cost uh, in net terms. So we end up with a situation in which labor is cheap and redundant because there is too much of it with respect to the prospects for employment. And that leads to the kind of disenfranchisement that gives us all sorts of different consequences around the world. Nihilism is one of these. If you look on my blog site, the web address is at the end of this talk, you'll see some comments there on nihilism and what it means for the world and for disaster risk reduction. So you could say that in many ways disasters have a value, a positive value, but for whom? They consolidate power structures. People are acted upon at their weakest. And if you read Anthony Lowenstein, Disaster Capitalism, or Naomi Klein, several books on the same subject, you get the uh, full details of just how this happens. Disasters all make profits and control, consolidate or uh, concentrate wealth in particular places. They can lead to economic swings. 
towards the wealthy, however, because they are the people who control the capital involved. They, disasters can also involve the introduction of repressive measures, and you can chart that, for example, in Indonesia, where repressive measures have been enacted by Parliament after disasters on various occasions, and there is good evidence of it. And disasters permit gratuitous social engineering, which means that we can configure society with them when people are too weak to resist in ways that will favour capital but not labour. So, um, the question of context to recapitulate means that susceptibility to disaster is that mixture, as the egg hypothesis suggests, of specific vulnerability to disaster which, is in, which exists in a context of general vulnerability to life's other shocks. And there is no way that we can reduce vulnerability to disaster on its own if we can't reduce vulnerability to the other things. It always reminds me of how in Addis Ababa, at a time when Ethiopia was at war with itself, there was a flood, a flash flood, and 119 people were killed, and it didn't matter. Why didn't it matter? It was just another day. There were so many other things to preoccupy the residents of Addis Ababa that it, it was rather like the sorts of things that happened during uh, major wars. During the Second World War, there were very similar events where people would die a thousand at a time. And it hardly registered because it was wartime and people were dying all over the place. Context was all important, sadly. Now, let's um, devote some time to looking at London, which is where I was born, <coughs> where we work. And um, an official report suggests that it would be a very resilient city uh, because it's got a lot of structures that are angled towards producing resilience. It's got a good civil protection system and it's got reasonably good emergency services and so on. But the high price of property really undermines resilience in all fields. Foreign investment companies own, for example, in central London, 22,000 properties. You have entire buildings where the lights are off because nobody lives there. They are basically cassettes of investment. They are not homes, which means that we have people who simply can't find anywhere to live because they can't afford it. At the same time, we have a vast amount of empty property, all of it luxury property, much of it owned in Singapore or the British Virgin Islands tax haven. So there is a shortage of housing because so much housing, vast amounts of housing are being built and very little of it is of any use to ordinary people. 511 tower blocks are proposed for London of which many are residential and none of them will be accessible to the population. Large proportion of disposable income for those who must find housing in London is spent on rents or on mortgages to buy property meaning that their income for other things is rather less. So the result of that is that due to an unbalanced housing market, then um, housing tends to be poor quality. You can sell or rent housing that really isn't adequate in many respects, is insanitary, is unstable and so on to people for high prices. Yes, there are laws against this. Yes, there is an inspection regime and no, it doesn't work. But nevertheless, the net outcome of that is that personal and family security is reduced because the assets there are not there to um, devote to that particular problem. So the situation leaves a considerable number of people in their thousands living on the margins of society. Therefore, we might ask, for whom is resilience? You can be very resilient indeed if you run an investment company from the Virgin Islands and you have a wealth of property in your portfolio in London and you have no reason and no need to rent out to anyone. You can keep it empty, keep it maintained and eventually sell it at an enormous profit. And is that good for society? Certainly not. Now let's look at one outcome of that, namely the <coughs> tragedy that occurred in June 2017 at a place called Grenfell Tower, and there is no example in the Western world 
that exhibits more starkly the difference between the effect of disaster on the rich and on the poor, because Grenfell Tower occurred in a municipality, a borough of London, London Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, which is the richest in the country. In the south of the borough on Fulham Road, if you want to hire, if you want to rent a modest apartment, it will cost you of the order of 5,000 euros a week. Uh, providing it's a modest apartment. If it's not a modest apartment, it will cost you about 16,000 euros a week. In the north of the borough, instead, we have this. Now, is it possible that in the 21st century, with the technology and the knowledge we have of tall buildings, that you can get a sheet of flame from floor one to floor 24? 24-storey residential building with 129 apartments in it, built in 1970 quite solidly because in 1967 there had been a progressive collapse after a gas explosion in a similar building and therefore there have been changes in the way these things are built to make them resistant to progressive collapse. The progressive collapse, of course, involved fatalities in London. So, but nevertheless, um, after renovation in 2015 and 16, where a relatively modest sum of money was cut from the cladding, the cost of the cladding, and another sum of money was saved, amounting to less than half a million euros, on not providing a sprinkler system within the building, despite the fact that it really ought to be mandatory. So we end up with a fire that starts in the middle of the night and by the morning 72 people are dead, 74 are injured, 30 of them critically, 65 people have been rescued and goodness knows what happened to anyone else. And that is what it looked like at its worst. The fire climbed up the outside on flammable cladding, affected the inside and for the occupants that was it. It was an enclave of poverty absolute poverty in many instances in Britain's richest municipality. A municipality where there are people who are so wealthy uh, it's absolutely mind-boggling how much they owe. A concentration of billionaires which is actually the largest in the world, greater than Tokyo, New York City and similar places. And since then, of course, we've had a great deal of news. There is a public inquiry going on, but it is amazing how virtually all of the news, I would say 99.5% of the news that is not unofficial, that doesn't come from the grassroots, has been negative news. In other words, it has made you uh, think, it perhaps has made your blood boil, made you angry. Uh, much of it has been scandalous news. I'm covering all sorts of things that really should never have happened or are happening now and should not be happening. So, some context of the fire tragedy. There have been a number of other fire tragedies in France, Australia, well, all sorts of parts of the world. I have a diagram of that to follow. And above all in the United Kingdom, in Scotland, Stevenage, Southampton, a variety of other cities, which have involved deaths and the coroner afterwards in the report on the deaths has made recommendations about fire safety in tall buildings and all of those recommendations have been ignored each time, not once but repeatedly over decades. The cladding used in the renovation in 2015 was not in any way fire resistant. Indeed, it was absolutely brilliant at transmitting fire and fire will climb up the side of a building and force its way inside. And that is exactly what happened. Now, what, under what circumstances would you use cladding that is uh, deadly on a building of this kind? That is a good question, an open question, and one that is examined in the inquiry that is ongoing. But the building codes have been <coughs> weakened. In fact, they've been reduced by more than half, such that very good provisions to ensure public safety in building have been abandoned. Then there was the inspection regime. We used to have building inspectors to save money. We don't have them anymore. Instead, we leave it to the construction industry to certify itself. Have you built this building well? Yes, of course we have. How do you know? Well, I didn't bother to find out, really. I'm just telling you. <laughs> 
but you can accept that because the regulations allow it. Great. Residents' concerns are uh, all on the internet because there was a residents' website where repeatedly they voiced concerns about the problems with the tower, which included an electrical problem that caused electrical goods in apartments spontaneously to catch fire as a result of electrical surges caused by a short circuit in the electrical main. Well, nothing was done about that. Indeed, it was roundly ignored for six years. And you can read the full chronicle in the residents' website. It's, as far as I know, still there. So, the fire service, amazingly, despite the proliferation of tall buildings in London, was not geared up for high-rise rescue. It took them 109 minutes, once they have realised the need for it, to get in an aerial ladder from the county of Surrey a long way away. It was the middle of the night, but so what? Who says these things only occur during the day? So that was another problem. Moreover, the advice that they gave to residents was to stay put because fires compartmentalize. In other words, they don't spread, and it spread like wildfire. Well, it was wildfire, and it spread. So the wrong advice was given to residents. The local authority response to the fire was utterly ineffective. In the end, the local authority had to be disbanded because its initial response was completely hopeless. And in fact, it was supplanted by NGOs, particularly Muslim NGOs, who did pretty well. Uh, but really, there should have been an official response that was a lot better. But where was democracy in Kensington and Chelsea, run by rich people for rich people? And that was patently obvious. So inappropriate responses to the disaster definitely increased the suffering. I waited <coughs> about four days before I actually went down there to, uh, to see it. And, when I went down there, such was post-traumatic stress disorder that people were rolling in the gutters and screaming, quite literally. And the situation was pretty desperate, and so it remained, and for some people it remains so even now. One billion is the probable cost of this fire, composed of the public inquiry, which employs about 25 lawyers at very high cost for a couple of years, for example, litigation uh, arising, not merely the public inquiry. Rehousing and rehabilitation, very difficult in a place where the average uh, price of a house is in the millions, actually. It's well over one million. Uh, plenty of housing available, enormous amounts of empty housing in Kensington and Chelsea, but it is not low-level uh, social housing. It is the sort of housing that so uh, to purchase it would cost you millions per, per unit. Compensation to the victims eventually is likely to arise, and that will take a long time as well. Those who survived, of course, and some dependents. And then demolition of the block itself and a number of other places. We also, I didn't put on this, there's the cost of contamination and pollution, because there now has been revealed to be a lot of that in the local area, which may also have health effects for the survivors who remain there. There are moreover cascading effects. This is not entirely a problem limited to this one building, not at all. In fact, it has now become nationwide, if not international, because it was discovered thereafter <laughs> in a hurried survey that 311 tower blocks in the UK were deemed utterly unsafe. They were death traps, and they still are in many instances. Something had to be done about them. In Camden up the road, there were panic evacuations of three tower blocks, very similar to this, with flammable cladding. And they didn't really know what to do with the residents, including those who were very old or had disabilities and so on. Fire wardens in other buildings had to be hired round the clock to keep an eye on whether fires would break out or not and warn people, and that cost a great deal of money. And then there were disputes about who would pay for recladding buildings that were clad in flammable material. You can go around London and see buildings partly stripped off, and the reason why they are partly stripped off is because there's still uh, massive arguments about who pays for the cost. Do the residents pay or do the building owner pay? And all sorts of stuff is going on with litigation. 
And those who actually have bought apartments in buildings like this can't sell them. The value of them goes down from, say, £800,000 to 50000 or 30000 They're unsaleable, in effect. More context. There was a failure, a clear, evident <coughs> failure, to manage risk as it affects people who are not wealthy. You can bet that you won't get fires like this in tower blocks owned by wealthy people. One has just been constructed on the banks of the River Thames. It's 50 stories high. <coughs> uh, only 18.6% of the apartments are actually occupied. The rest are investment properties. But in any case, you can be sure that it's got the latest technology in fire resistance and suppression. Safety regulations are constantly being um, affected by commercial lobbying because they cost money. Safety is expensive, even though it is necessary. Well, you could say the consequences of disaster are more expensive than providing safety. For example, the cost of providing sprinklers in Grenfell Tower, which would have suppressed the fire, was about 0.34% of the cost of renovation, which is negligible, but they still wanted to save money as they did on the cladding. There is an ideological retreat from what was provided in the 1950s and 60s, only good, safe public housing, and that is a political decision, no more and no less. But London, paradoxically, it needs basic service workers. It needs people to be the nannies of the rich people's children, to drive the buses, the ambulances, and all the rest of it. Where will they live? So it does tend to throw government elitism into sharp relief, especially as the Prime Minister came to Grenfell Tower and refused to meet any of the residents, a fact that was immediately noted by the residents and the mass media and social media. Well, Grenfell Tower has its roots in the same problem in other parts of the world, and these are places around the world where similar things have happened. So this is not entirely an isolated local event. Very similar things have happened in a whole variety of countries. So it's something we might learn for on a wider basis. But the conclusion of it is that really Grenfell Tower is nothing more as a tragedy than the artifact of neoliberal policies that have weakened safety, but above all, they've weakened safety for those who can't afford to buy it for themselves. And therefore, we wait with interest to see whether the public inquiry, <laughs> chaired by a perfect member of the establishment and the elitists, will actually produce something that is an accurate representation of what has gone on in this case. It might or it might not. A quick word about human mobility. Many of the residents of Grenfell Tower are in fact the product of human mobility. And I think we've passed some kind of threshold where mobility is now an inevitable fact of human life. Supposing we get a migration crisis and some other form of disaster superimposed, then we're going to see something rather different, are we not? Human mobility is actually quite a complex phenomenon. There are the refugees of, I don't know what, war, conflict, torture, and oppression of various kinds, who wish to get out of their country, cross a national border and be safe somewhere. There are so-called economic migrants who wish to have a better set of circumstances. There are official routes where they can go from, say, the Philippines to Saudi Arabia. What happens to them when they're there or in Qatar or somewhere is, is another question. There are people who are displaced by whatever. It might be the building of a dam and a reservoir, or it might be conflict again, or whatever, the Syrians. And then there are the opportunists. I've immigrated twice myself, and uh, in the uh, process acquired a second nationality. So, uh, but we are a different category altogether. Migration can be voluntary. It can be induced in as much as there are few alternatives, or it can be forced. But it's surprising where you find forced migration as well. Mobility can be temporary or it can be semi-permanent or permanent. It can lead to statelessness, especially where people simply cannot go home and they are denied some kind of ability to establish themselves somewhere, and there are plenty of those. It always makes me mad that here we are supposed to be Christians, but if we are to find a carpenter and his pregnant wife on the back of 
uh, a mule, what will we do to them? Incarcerate them and then send them back to their place of origin. Very Christian. <laughs> Human mobility. It is a reaction to global hegemony. It's particularly a reaction to proxy wars. Proxy wars are going on in places like Afghanistan and Yemen, where the great powers and Syria. Syria is currently very much a muddle. Why? Well, not least because it is a very complex proxy war with some very odd decision making currently going on there. The struggle for power around the world and the victims of the people on the ground. The globalization of labor and its exploitation and production and so on. What does that mean in terms of the demand for labor and changes in that which to someone who is simply in the works might appear thoroughly arbitrary and of course capital which can move from place to place with unbelievable speed far greater than labor could ever move if it can move at all and we end up with situations like that there you are the rich people playing golf and the migrants trying to get into the spanish enclave in north africa uh, and move towards europe but it's time that we thought again about geographical inertia when disasters occur we rebuild in the same place Tokyo, here it is, is reckoned to be the most at-risk city in the world. In other words, it's got floods, earthquakes, tsunamis, post-earthquake fire and all the rest of it that could do more damage than to anywhere else. Okay, possibly. But if it does occur, if we get a repeat of the 1920 Kanto earthquake, then it's most probable that Tokyo will be rebuilt where it is. So places remain. But we're now in a situation where places might remain, but people are going to move. And it brings into question a whole list of things that are dearly held, but in fact, are they quite as permanent as we might think? For example, the idea of identity and sovereignty. How old are these? Well, you can trace modern sovereignty back to 1628 and the Peace of Westphalia. I don't quite know why, I'm not enough of a historian, but you can read up on that and see for yourself. This is what they say. And it sort of established the way that modern states uh, came into being. And from that, we derive identity, which depends upon our statehood and our position in the state and so on, in the modern form. And you have to have identity. Uh, you should feel sorry, perhaps, for um, an Indonesian who has only one name in a world in which we have to have at least two and how they find their way around this. We have a lecturer at one British university who is an Indonesian of this kind. He's only got one name. He's got no surname, no first name, just one name. That's almost illegal in the present world because of identity. Entitlement is very much under uh, discussion, under, under stress even. For example, R2P, responsibility to protect. Well, it is a legal principle, but it is being abandoned wholesale all over the place. But I would like to concentrate briefly on welfare. What is it? The curious thing is you don't find definitions of it. You can read as much disasterology as you like, and you won't find out about welfare. Here's my definition of it. I tried to provide my own. I couldn't find one in the literature. It's too much of a hot potato. It's an obvious thing. It's dead easy to define. They don't want to. It's too politically dangerous to define welfare, especially as you can abolish it or change it or reduce it as you like. But also, bear in mind, we need to decide what welfare is not as well as what it is. In other words, what instead is forgiveness money or charity money and so on, where we actually compensate people, give them a prize for taking risks they should never have taken. That is not welfare, although it often comes under the banner, the umbrella of welfare. And it costs a lot of public money, but it buys votes. So there are alternatives to welfare, such as remittances that have become increasingly important, largely because there isn't much in the way of an alternative to them from expatriates who send money back. But there we are, we're in the world of mass cognitive dissonance. On one side we've got a whole series of positive things, on the other side a whole series of negative things. So when we see migration in particular, we tend to look at it from this kind of, uh, uh, of way. But 
which of these traits is going to win out of this? We're into an age where conflict within society or stress within society seems to be higher than it was five years ago or ten years ago and increasing. Nihilism is one of the effects of it, but also so is this cognitive dissonance, which is very much fueled by migration, or indeed not even migration, but fear of it. A national emergency was declared in the United States because on one day, 40 people managed to get into the country by a purloined boat and cross the English Channel from France. At the same time, there is no national emergency with one and a half million destitute people. That's not a national emergency. You have children coming to school and fainting through lack of food. They can't afford shoes. They can't afford new clothes and so on. And that's not a national emergency, but 40 people in a boat reaching the country illegally, so-called. Well, it may not be illegally. If they're proper refugees, it isn't illegal at all. Uh, but there you are. That's how these things are, are viewed. So there are links between human mobility and disaster risk reduction, but we haven't developed them enough yet. Uh, there are links in terms of things like evacuation and migration. And there are antecedents, for example, in terms of induced migration after the 1980 earthquake in southern Italy, the Italian government, owner of the national airline Alitalia, gave people one-way tickets to exotic places like Western Canada or Australia in the hope they would go there and not come back and therefore reduce the need for housing and all the rest of it. Relatively cheaply, you could give them a, a ticket on an aircraft to get out of the country and not come back. If they had, for example, relatives uh, who'd emigrated to Venezuela or uh, Sydney or wherever. Interesting. And in fact, there was forced migration as revealed by studies by uh, Anthony Oliver Smith, the eminent anthropologist, after Hurricane Katrina. People had to go because they had to go, because they were basically frog-marched by the army into coaches and taken off to Texas. So we live in a world in which a variety of different things are happening that may interact. Natural disasters, so-called. The only natural part is the trigger, of course. Technological disasters, major incidents. We end up with natex where they overlap, where the natural part of it or whatever, the flood or whatever, causes the uh, pollution incident or the explosion or whatever. We have possibility of pandemics. We have migration emergencies because of large numbers of displaced homeless people unable to look after themselves. We have the effect of conflict in its various forms, from asymmetrical to formal conflict, and all of this against the background population increase and environmental change. It's a lot to deal with. And also, we need to think about the ethical, moral, legal framework for all of that, which is often uh, not adequately respected, especially in places where relief is systematically denied to people, which is perhaps an ethical, moral brief, or where human rights are not adequately uh, guaranteed to people. So, time for some conclusions, high time for some conclusions. Much of the theory we use in disaster risk reduction was made in the 1960s, or at least born in the 1960s and developed in the 1970s. 1970 to 73 was a period where massive divergences in wealth began and they have increased ever since. And the current projection is that by 2030, a tiny handful of people will own two thirds of the world's wealth, which will further deny the mass of the population, the 99.999%, from being able to use those resources to do what they need to do to save and protect themselves, if that comes to pass. So we live in a world in which we might want disaster risk reduction, but some commentators are talking about disaster risk creation instead of reduction and that the predisposition of things actually creates the conditions for disaster rather than reducing them. Are we going backwards instead of forwards? So you can have your limited local success, but if you ignore the context of it, it's not going to get you far. Of course, we live in a world in which there is a dialectic between things that create vulnerability and things that reduce it. 
We also have the perceptual side of it, which is the wild card. Risk perception, is it positive or negative? Do people perceive the need to reduce risk? And do they perceive that as a priority? Is there public pressure? And if there is, is there democracy whereby this could actually take place? Reduction of risk. Good question. So when you're studying this, what you need to study is not so much hazard <coughs> or vulnerability in its own right, important though they are, or even resilience against these two things, but the interfaces between the system, technical, natural, social, political, technical, and so on. The interfaces are where the really interesting problems lie. And we want this to be sustainable as well, but sustainability means we have to talk about emerging and daily risks and the general problem of being sustainable, not merely the sustainability of disaster reduction measures, because it means nothing on its own. So that basically is all I have to say. There are some further remarks on my blog site and there are things on my slide chair site. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for listening. Obrigado. And uh, if you have any questions. <laughs>